Good morning, everybody. My name is Lionel Vemaju. I'll be the moderator for today's class. We've got some uh, folks that normally join us that are doing some traveling today, which is uh, fantastic for them. And thank you very much for uh, for joining today. Um, again, I'll be your moderator today, uh, so we'll kind of go from there. Welcome. Sorry. There we go. Welcome to uh, my name is Lionel. Lionel will be your moderator today. This is a school and not a church. Neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational religious and scientific organization it's dedicated to showing the proof of the existence of Yahweh. Our Elohim and the operation of his purpose, pattern, and plan operating through eternity this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in 1958. We hold classes in the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. The Hamilton branch was established in 1968. In this school, we use the true, correct original names and titles of the Father. The Word or Son and the Holy Spirit, which became the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Father is Yahweh, is being properly sensed by the Lord. The true title of the Word or Son is Elohim, is being properly sensed by God. The true name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of physical body is Yahshua, is being erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul tells in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many. And they're God's many. Therefore, each Lord must have a name, and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title. But unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means that Elohim is a title our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but it's an erroneous name. A minor investigation in your part in a dictionary or encyclopedia will prove to you that neither the Greek language nor the Latin language or the Hebrew language have any characters, letters, and alphabet. That produced a sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah. Therefore, making such names as Jesus and Jehovah and possible renderings of the true name of the Father and Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this day is inscrutable and incomprehensible. He's the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh and his pure spirits that symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to depict himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of the chart to show you that everything on the chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides in the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man cannot perceive himself in this pure spirit state, took on shape and form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super corporal being, is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh or blood. This same spirit manifests himself and walked the earth as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there's only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name, that name. So the simple yet intelligent question we shall ask ourselves is what was the name of the Savior during the time that he walked the airplane? A further understanding of these names and titles may be had by reading a preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in the school we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It's the divine pattern because it's Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses to top Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. He instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The tabernacle consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates in accord with the threefold structure and function of this pattern, and then nothing escapes the pattern. The primary constitutional aims or sorry, the, the aims and objectives of this school are as follows. Number one, to help you find and know Yahweh, our LM, as he really is and actually exists. Two, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, sex, creed, caste, or color. Three, to investigate the, uh, to investigate the unexplained, un, un, unexplained spirit law or the spirit, uh, spirit law or so-called 
law of nature and the powers leading to man. Sorry about that. Four, to encourage and promote the study of scriptures, comparative religion, psychology, philosophy, modern practical and occult science. Five, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through dispensations and ages. Seven, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan as demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through dispensations of time. Eight, to earnestly contend for the common salvation of faith, which was once delivered unto the sons of children of Yahweh. Nine, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men where a man can be saved, save the name of Yahweh the Messiah. Ten, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahweh the Messiah with the hope of moral glorification in the new earth state. Our watchers peace, our slogan is speak the truth. This morning we'll have a prayer by uh, Dr. Patty Islam from uh, uh, from uh, the Pittsburgh area, uh, followed by a song selection, selection by Daryl and Kathy. And our scripture uh, reading today will be uh, Psalms, the 19th uh, chapter. If that can be read by Dr. Patrice Williams from Detroit, that'd be great. Thank you. All righty, everybody. I hope, yeah, it looks like my speaker's on. Thank goodness. What? Hallelujah. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first, we need to bow our hearts and minds and be thankful to Yahshua through through Yahweh. I'm sorry. I wasn't prepared this morning. I'm very, very sorry. I praise him every day through my breath. Bow our hearts and minds. Be thankful to Yahweh through Yahshua. Hold in our hearts and minds that which Joshua will be giving to the speakers today, that we will all be edified in the spirit and truth, and to bring forth our, our knowledge to others that Joshua has chosen. And from all of us, how thankful we are for these greatest gifts of Yahweh through Joshua. And we ask that you watch over our travelers today. <laughs> and I'm so thankful to have the brethren to keep us all together uh, with this knowledge and the new knowledge that we receive. May we all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Baby. 
the prize. That's why I'm so glad I'm free. I'm so glad I'm free. I'm so glad I'm free in Yahshua. I'm so glad I'm free. I'm so glad I'm free. Cause He's forgiven me for my iniquity. I'm just so glad I'm free today. I'm free. Joshua had mercy on me. I'm free. You opened up my eyes to see. I'm free. Joshua was my sacrifice so that I can have life. He paid the price. I'm so glad I'm free. I'm so glad I'm free. I'm so glad I'm free in Yahshua. I'm so glad I'm free. I'm so glad I'm free. Cause He's forgiven me for my iniquity. I'm just so glad I'm free today. Lovely, thank you. Greetings, brethren. I'll be reading the 19th division of Psalms today from the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name version of the Old and so-called New Testament, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised in 1989 by A.B. Trina of the Scripture Research Association Incorporated, Post Office Box 988, College Park, Maryland. Psalms, the 19th Division. The heavens declare the glory of El, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Yet their message is gone out through all the earth and their story to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahweh are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Yahweh, my rock and my redeemer. That was the 19th division of the book of Psalms. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you very much, Patrice, for reading. Thank you, Patty, for your prayer. And thank you, Daryl and Kathy, for sharing a song selection. It's a wonderful uh, opportunity and blessing we're able to get together. Welcome our visitors from near, near and far. I did send out invites as well to some of the vessels and souls out there in, in Africa and beyond. So we'll see if they join or not. Um, uh, 
this morning, uh, Nick, Sam, and Ben are traveling down to uh, South Carolina, and they have with them uh, some first-time listeners, Asher and Logan. I know you guys are traveling somewhere in West Virginia, as you said earlier. So may may yeah, we keep you strong and safe through Yahshua Messiah, and may your ears hear something that may encourage you to investigate these things for yourself further. That's very important. We'll most likely have a three-speaker format today, Yahweh yeah, willing. And with that, if I could call upon our first speaker, uh, Dr. Daryl Yules from Bedford, PA, if you're able. Yes, hello. Uh, good morning, or whatever time zone you're in. I think uh, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. It is a good thing to have, uh, here, I'll get my charts up. It's good to, it is good to have a first, uh, to, come down here and to have a chance to learn something about our great creator um and being uh it's it's always great when we have some new people come and it always brings back memories of the first time that we came that i came into class and uh um i think it was for me a very weird experience because you hear things that you don't hear anywhere else and it's very different some things will sound similar but a lot of things uh sound different um and we talk about the fact that this is a school and not a church um we're not uh th this as it was said in the moderation this uh that dr kinley had a vision of revelation back in 1931 and um, that's something uh, that some people claim in the world. But uh, one thing that was different about what Dr. Kinley said, he said, make it, make me prove it until you're satisfied. And I, I was in the church uh, for a long time, very steeped in it. I uh, actually went to seminary school and was a pastor of a couple of churches. Um, and uh, I was always told to rely on blind faith, uh, that we need to just believe um, and what, what were we believing? Uh, we were believing what somebody told us. And oftentimes our parents and our family, probably vast majority of the time, I uh, was raised a Christian in a Protestant denomination um, and, uh, you know, grew up again with these things that I was taught um, through rituals and regular, you know, worship services and bible studies and all that kind of stuff and um um but but uh you know and, and you know i would question it just like everybody else questioned it um trying to understand something about my you know about god i wanted to know about god um i, I did have a desire for it um but um the thing is, as I was studying it, even in the seminary, there's so many different denominations and people see things so many different ways. Um, and you were, you know, basically told that you had to believe, you know, you just believe, just believe. I heard that frequently. But Dr. Kinley, he said, make me prove it to you're satisfied. Now that's something different because most ministers and priests or whatever denomination you're in tell you that you you know it's not about proving it it's about faith they see those things as different things um and i want uh, if somebody could get um get me uh john seven, 17 and 3 for me see we don't you know knowing something in the church was knowing it through faith but that's that's not exactly how this is. Can somebody get that for me? John 17 and 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know that thou only art the true ill and Yahshua the Messiah whom thou hast sent. See, this is life and eternal, that you may know that. See, in, in the King James Version, it says that you may know him, that you may know Yahweh. And I'm going to get to the names here in a second. But but uh, life eternal is to know him, see? And he didn't leave it up to us just to, to have blind faith, to be honest with you. Um, uh, get me, uh, uh, get me, uh, give me a, what are the, a couple of the verses on witnesses here. 
my mind's going blank. It's somebody. Deuteronomy 1915. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, get me Deuteronomy 1915 and get me Matthew 1816 too, please. Deuteronomy 1915. One witness shall not rise against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, in any sin that he sinneth, at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. See, the mouth of two or three witnesses shall anything, everything be established. They talk, yes, the book talks about having witnesses to things. And uh, give me Matthew too, please. Just another another witness, because he just said in the mouths of two or three witnesses. Matthew 18, 16, please. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. See, in the mouths of two or three witnesses, every, every word will be established, see. Um, he gives witnesses. Um, Get me First Thessalonians five and twenty one. I just want to, and I'm bringing these up because I want to. It's so important for us, us here, to remember all the time that we need witnesses for this thing, the things that we learn. It's not about just blind faith. That's not what we're teaching down here. First Thessalonians five twenty one. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Prove all things. It says to prove things, see? Now, how do you go about to prove something, okay? You need witnesses. And this is true in our everyday life. We have to have witnesses that something's true or not. Look, at we buy a car, we look for witnesses. We research it online. We take the car for a test drive, you know? Um, we find out as much as we can about things that are important to us, see? And um, and uh, so we, we want witnesses. Now, the witnesses are, are showing that something happens over and over again. In real life, um, uh, we, we check things out with our physical life. And, but we need to do the same thing with our spiritual life, not just our physical life. We need to check things out. Um, I, I want the words of wisdom. Um, I could actually read it. It's, um, this is taken from the um, Elohim book. Uh, and it, it's in the uh, first volume. And uh, it's um, page one of the volume. It's in the last paragraph. I'm going to read it. It's towards the end of the last paragraph. This is, uh, just so you know, the Elohim book for new people is a, is a book that the, um, Dr. Kinley had published, the founder of the school. Um, and it's that we, that's, we can call that our textbook. It's our textbook. And it gives a lot of information. Um, and in the book, he says, did it ever occur to you that we remain ignorant of attested truth and scientific pro scientifically proven facts, most particularly because we failed to do make a personal detailed investigation of important matters? The failure to investigate positively retards the progress of our understanding and knowledge in every vocation and phase of life, both physical and spiritual. Sometimes stopping and thinking for a moment over the essential things of life eliminates many regretted years of poverty, sickness, humiliation, embarrassment, sometimes death and destruction. Therefore, we should learn to pause and try to think intelligently before we finally conclude affirmatively or negatively we should do this before an ultimatum or final decision is rendered in any secular subject. The majority of us are, to some extent, guilty of this negligence. See, but he's not just talking to us about secular things. Secular means physical. He's talking about spiritual things, that we can know something about him. Now, he gives us in the book ways for us to know something about him. 
there's certain ways. So if you can get me, um, oh, get me Isaiah to the law and to the testimony. Um, I want that. I want, and also I want, uh, um, well, give me, let's get that first. And I want Romans 1, 19 and 20. Isaiah 8 and 20. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. See, and light means truth. Light and truth go together. And life, they all go together, see? Um, now, um, he's telling us, and, this, and we're talking about, spiritual truth and spiritual life and we're telling you there's a way to prove it now in the church when we're in the church the bible seemed to contradict itself all the time and people just decided that this wasn't like written but it was it was like um people that have tried to explain what they think are contradictions by saying they're just stories and fables and it's not real and a lot of people wrote it and all these other things say, and they don't mean it exactly that way, but see, and you will learn if you could come to this class and you investigate that when you come down here, we could show you evidence of things and we can make sense of the things that seem contradictory. And we're going to get to that in a little bit here. Um, so to the law and the testimony, get me acts uh, 17 and 44. So the law and the, in the testimony it means the law and the prophets. So the Bible is one of our witnesses. We are going to use the 744, Bible. 744. Oh, 744. Yeah. Acts 744. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. Yeah. It's the tabernacle of witness, it's called. And if you listen to the moderation, you heard the moderator talk about the tabernacle, which is another witness to us, is the tabernacle of witness. Now give me Romans 119, 119 and 20. Romans 119, because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them. For Yahweh hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and supernal nature, so that they are without excuse. Now you heard in the moderation, the moderator talked about that Yahweh is spirit, you see, and in this state he's incomprehensible and inscrutable, see. Um, now the world realizes that that God is spirit, but they conclude that you can't know anything about him except through faith. Um, with, with, um, but see, this scripture says that the invisible things of him can be seen and understood by the things that are made, see? So th that's another witness and what we're looking for are witnesses to show us something about God, okay? Something about our creator, see? In the scripture lesson today, let's get that, because that also is making reference to the same thing as 119 and 20. Psalms. Psalms 19 and 1. The heavens declare the glory of El, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day and see, day. Yeah, see, the heavens declare the glory of El, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Keep going. Verse 2, day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Yet their message is gone out through all the earth, and their story to the ends of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. See, he there's that word tabernacle again. There's a ta the tabernacle, um, and I'm not, I'm sort of giving a groundwork for an understanding of what we do down here, 
um, that we're not just coming down here. Look at, I didn't have a prepared, look, I was, a, I was a pastor of two churches. I was a minister. I wore the collar and everything. I prepared my sermons. We don't prepare sermons down here. Now, mind you, we do study. This is a school. But when we get up, we teach about the things that we've learned and how we've learned them. And I'm just sort of laying a groundwork of how we try to show you that we can know something about our great creator, that he provided witnesses for us, see? And um, so it talks about the heaven declaring uh, the glory of Elohim, see? So the creation, basically it's saying, um, declares his glory. Now they talk about in the moderation we talk about, um, which is an introduction also to the to the school and what we're about. See, and this is from and and I remember first coming to the class and we came to a physical class and all of these charts. I'll flip through them a little bit, but all of these charts were up on the floor and you could see them when you when you see a um, Lionel's uh, picture. I remember all these things just looking so somewhat confusing and amazing and like nothing I've ever seen before. Um, and and um, these charts are based on Dr. Kinley's vision, but they're also showing the stories and the, um, the information that is written in your book. So in Exodus, I'm not going to get it all because I, we can't get everything, but um, Moses was called up at top, top Mount Sinai, and he had a vision. It talks about it in the in the in the moderation. See, he had a vision up on the top of this mount where he saw Yahweh Elohim um, appear. He appeared unto them over here, and then Moses was called up higher. See, and what he saw was he saw Elohim uh, transmutate into the tabernacle pattern. And, in, and then he's told the story of the creation, see? Now, um, that tabernacle pattern, Moses was instructed to have this built down here in the, in the, in the wilderness. And it's very specific directions to this tabernacle pattern. And uh, so this is a witness, and we're going to get into that too. Somebody will get into that. Like I said, we're talking about we can't get into everything and. And, and this might seem long uh, for people that come into church. I remember when I first came in, coming into a two-hour class seemed long. We didn't have two-hour services. We had one-hour services. Um, <laughs> but we two hours isn't enough time to even put a dent in all of the things that we've learned down here about our Creator. And not one of them isn't based on witnesses. Now, I want to get something that's a bit, uh, something that, I want to look at, like, we, I talked about how the world, um, re, and I did, when I read that book, I thought uh, um, there were things in there that didn't make sense, right? There's things in there that just didn't make sense. Um, let's see. Let's get John 1 and 1, and, well, let's, let's get, first... Uh, Get John 1 and 1, and I want an Exodus where um, they're going up on the mount. John first, please. John 1 and 1. And read it in the King James Version for me, please. John read the, James use James. the, don't, don't put the names in. Want yes. it the way it's written. Thanks. John 1 and 1, King James Version. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for the, a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighted every man that come into the world. Yeah, I actually jumped down to 18. John King James Version 118. No man has seen God at any time. 
the only see it's it's now it says here that no man has seen God at any time. Now give me Exodus twenty four. So I want to go ahead. Actually, I'm going to come back to John one one, but go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Exodus twenty four and nine. Then went up Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the seventy elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. Me now, see, this is I told you. This these charts are you know they're pictorial images of of aspects of the Bible. And then went up Noah, Noah, Aaron. Go ahead, read that again. <laughs> then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab, Moses. and Abihu, and the <laughs> yeah. seventy elders of Israel. So, so those people are picture, pictured here. Um, and go ahead. And they saw the God of Israel. Okay, so now wait a second. And I'm just using this one example. But I remember this when I was in the church. It's like, well, this can't, you know, something has to be wrong here. They can't both be true. See, that's how I looked at it. That's how Christians look at it. This can't be true. Um, now, it says in John 1, nobody, nobody's ever seen God. And here it says they went up and they saw God, okay? Now, how is that possible? See, now I want to get Romans. So we've people have come up with all kinds of explanations to try to make sense of this. See, um, but it really does make sense. It makes sense um, if you don't understand things and you don't find the witnesses to help to explain things. See, um, now. There's a contradiction here, and the reason there's a contradiction is because the true and correct name and titles are not being used um, because those were stripped out of the book. Now, we talked about in the moderation, uh, the moderator talked about the names. Um, uh, where am I? So he talked about the names. And we have these names here, and people people get mad that we use these names. Um, but there's witnesses to pr prove that these names are accurate. Now, <clears throat> Lord and God are not names; um, they're titles. Let's get um, uh, at the bush when uh, Moses asks his name. Now, Moses, we know from the stories you've heard, everybody in the church, the great, you know, Ten Commandment move me with Charlton Heston and everything. Everybody knows the story about how um, uh, Moses was down here in Egypt. I'm, I don't want to get into the whole thing, but he comes to this bush in the wilderness where he has a vision. Let's get that. Exodus 3 and 1. And again, read it with, with not putting in the true names. Yes, please. Exodus 3 and 1, King James Version. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock into the backside of the desert and came into a mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burnt with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the okay. bush? I don't wanna to have to go through all this because I don't have enough time, but let's jump down. Oh, so, so basically, you know the story, even as a Christian, that Moses came out here and he tells Moses, he basically is telling Moses that he wants Moses, Moses is gonna go down to Egypt to set his people free. And Moses, let's jump to where Moses asked the question about his name. Thirteen. Exodus three thirteen, King James Version. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me. What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Exodus. So, now listen to this. Moses, keep, stay there. Moses is asking. <laughs> Moses is saying, when I when I come to him and I ask his name, what 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 should I say to him? Um, he went to God to ask God his name. <laughs> this is the King James version. And he he says to God, "What's your name?" Well, obviously, God's not his name. Go ahead. 
And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shall thou say unto the children of Israel, I am, have sent me unto you. And God said, moreover unto Moses, thus shall thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. Now, as a Christian, I read that verse many times and it never even occurred to me. He never gave him a name. Look at there. There are many gods. Matter of fact, why would Moses even ask that question if everybody's just, if it's just God? That doesn't make any sense. Now, I want to tell you, we read, when I was in the seminary, we read this scripture and we looked at it in the Hebrew. <laughs> and we read it and, and it made a lot more sense when you, when you read it, but we still didn't get it. Um, but he actually reveals his name here. And they, and look at Christians know this. I'm telling you, and not all most Christians don't know this. You go into the seminary, they teach you, you learn what he really said. And now read it with the correct names, holy name or or substituting, either is fine. Holy name, Exodus 3:14. And Elohim said unto Moses, I will be what I will to be. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I will be had sent me unto you. Exodus 3.15. And Elohim said, un, said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Yahweh, the Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. Now listen to what he said. Now I want to tell you something. This I'm gonna and I people that have heard me get this again, but it's just something from from my past experience. Uh this is uh um look at uh reading from why did he ask him his name? Uh, this is a commentary, a Christian commentary called Life App Study Bible on this verse. It says, the Egyptians had many gods by many different names. Moses wanted to know God's name so the Hebrew people would know exactly who had sent him, see? It says they wanted to know God's name, see? And then another one, the Oxford commentary, another Christian one, it says, um, here the God in the bush so far is nameless to Moses, and he reveals his name to him, see? He, he needs to know what his name was. And it says, uh, in there they talk about the name, in, in the commentary it says, a, a strong tradition held that the bond between Israel and Yahweh went back to the time of Exodus from Egypt. Um, they say that. Um, now, I'm not putting that name Yahweh in there. They actually have what we call the tetragrammaton. It's the, the consonants. This is in the, in the, in the book. It says, um, it says Yahweh multiple times in this Christian commentary. See, his name is Yahweh. Um, you could ask a minister about it if they went to college, and they will tell you that the name Yahweh is what is in the book. <laughs> People want to give a lot of reasons why they don't use it, um, but but there's a reason. Now, I want to show how using the proper name and title can resolve the problem of the what appears to be a contradiction. I'm using one main thing. I'm not going to be up here real long, but I wanted to use one main example of showing you the importance of, of what we teach down here just by giving one example of a contradiction, because this, this class has solved so many contradictions for me and my feeble brain, okay? Um, so we, we explain to you, and, we, and there's witnesses for all this. We can't do all everything in one day. But Yahweh, in the, going back to the moderation, Yahweh's pure spirit, and in this state he's incomprehensible and inscrutable. See, Yahweh can't be seen in this state. 
Now, Yahweh took on shape and form right within himself as Elohim. See, um, and this is a visionary form, visionary shape and state, shape and form, a visionary state. He had to come out of the cloud. He had to come down to get in a visionary form in order for man to be able to see him and to know anything about him. See? And it's Yahweh, um, Elohim, and Yahshua, see? And so Elohim is him in, in that visionary shape and form, see? And so there's a that's a title. His name is still Yahweh all the way down, see? Yahshua means Yahweh is salvation. And we could get into that too. Um, uh, when 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 the angel came to Mary and Joseph and said you you will name him Yahshua because yeah yeah because he will save his people from their sins, Jesus doesn't mean he will save his people from their sins. Yahshua literally means Yahweh is salvation. That's why he's called Yahshua. See, <clears throat> and we we talk about there's no J or anything, but see how. This this knowing this information really could tell us something about our creator, which is life. And then we could give witnesses to it. We um, You have the example of uh, Moses here in the bush, and, and, and this is where the name is revealed, see? Now, we talked about the tabernacle pattern. I'm staying on this one principle right now because it's just the one I can't do everything. Um, but in the tab, we have this tabernacle pattern. Which is the pattern of everything, and we we can prove this to you. Um, we've done it with music, and we've done it with everything. You could do it with art. You could do it with everything. It goes by a pattern. Um, and in this particular chart, it's it's called "Man Made in the Image of Elohim" by the pattern of the universe. Um, and we could show you how the body actually goes by the tabernacle pattern. The tabernacle pattern is threefold. There's there's a whole a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. Um, now I'm going to go back a little bit. Remember, we just said there's Yahweh, Elohim, and Yahshua. See, this is all about showing us about our Creator. That He's threefold. The tabernacle pattern is threefold, and the physical body is threefold. There's a head cavity, a chest cavity, and an abdominal cavity. Now we have arms and legs. But you could live without all of those things. These are the main parts of the body. Plus, it still goes by the pattern. Because when they were out here in the wilderness, the tabernacle pattern was transported around. Uh, it moved all the time. They were wandering out here, see. And uh, the tabernacle pattern is threefold, like our body. Well, our body has, uh, we have our arms and our legs, four limbs around us. Um, and each of our limbs has three parts. Um, your arm has your hand, your forearm, and your uh, upper arm, and you you have your uh, upper leg, the thigh. You got the area with your shin, the lower leg, and then you got your foot. So there's there's three, 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 and three, four threes, and it was the same way with the tabernacle pattern. You had three tribes of Israel. There were twelve tribes of Israel that surrounded Israel. So those go to show forth your limbs. And they picked, they took this tabernacle apart, picked it up and carry them. So those limbs were responsible for moving that tabernacle up around. I'm getting off my track here, but I just want to show a little bit more evidence or witnesses that these go together. So there were 12 tribes, and we have the 12 parts of our limbs carrying this tabernacle around. And each of these things go according to the tabernacle pattern. Um, um, and it's all showing forth more than that. It's showing forth our great creator who has a name and the name is important. But it was in this, in, in the, um, oh, there's so many different witnesses. It's <laughs> go all over the place. Okay. I just want to show this one last thing anyways. So also there's the story of the Ten Commandments is a story of Moses leading the people out of Israel, that, that movie. Um, but the, that track, um, this this migration from uh, Egypt to Canaan's land is threefold, just like the tabernacle. 
you have in the court roundabout area, you have Egypt, and then the wilderness is likened unto the holy place, and Canaan's land is likened unto the most holy place. Where Moses received the name of Yash, Yahweh was in this burning book, which happened in the holy place, the center position. You go back to the chart, the tabernacle pattern, and in our tabernacle pattern, you have in the holy place is where our lungs happen. And in the lungs, there's these vessels that look like trees or bushes. And the process of breathing and oxidizing is a burning, say. So in the wilderness, you had a burning, but was the bush was burning. You got a bush burning here, and it was not consumed, say. Um, give me uh, one last verse, uh, Psalms, uh, every breath. See, 150 and 6. 150 and 6 or 15? I missed that. 150. Psalm 150, verse 6. Let everything that hath breath praise Yahweh. Praise ye yep. Yahweh. See, now the, the book talks about let everything that has breath praise Yahweh. Now, the name Yahweh is a name that you don't have to use tongue for. We actually breathe the name of Yahweh, and the book supports that. It says, everything that hath breath, praise Yahweh. So you breathe in. When you first take on life, and they, they I don't know if they still have to do that, but when the doctors slap the baby in the sleep, the baby, when we take in our first breath, first breath, the first thing we breathe in is yeah. And the last thing we breathe when we leave this, this world is See, and, and this is supporting, it's another witness to the name in the sense that um, it's, we breathe Yahweh. We don't breathe God. We don't breathe Jesus. And it means something. Yahweh means Yahweh is, I mean, Yahshua means Yahweh is salvation. And Yahweh means I will be what I will to be or to cause to exist, actually. But uh, it, where it says I am that I am, that's like Popeye, but that's not Yahweh. Yahweh is I will be what I will to be. Uh, there's so many different things, but I mainly wanted to show you that this, this is, it's like my brain's flying a mile a minute because there's just so many different witnesses and ways to go. Um, I just hope, I hope that that sparks something. Um, and uh, I hope somebody got something out of it and all praises and uh, glory go to Yahshua. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for your source, Dr. Yules. And, uh, always a blessing when we can get together. I'll just take a couple minutes as your next speaker here. Sorry, my uh, screen's are messing around with little different things technology-wise. But that name's important, right? And let's go to Isaiah 42 and 8. I'll be your next speaker for a little bit. I'm not going to take uh, the full time, but uh, if someone can grab that, please, it'd be great. Isaiah 42 and 8. That'd be great, Leonard. Thank you. You're welcome. I am Yahweh. That is my name. Jesus is Yahweh. He said, I am Yahweh, and that is my name. Okay, carry on. And my glory I will not give to another. And his glory he will not give to any other. Now, we just read there. Let's go over to Isaiah 19 in the first couple of verses, if we can. It's his name. He's not giving his glory to any other. He won't be satisfied if you call him anything else other than his name. Okay? When you finish, there's young folks listening in the car on their way down, you know, in the car there, uh, on their way down to uh, Myrtle Beach. Well, if you just finished high school or about to, you know, or finish a project or college or whatever, any level, or in the office, whatever, in the workplace or on a, in a trade, when you finish a project or you get your diploma, you don't want to have your friend's name on it. If you contribute to that project, you want to have your name on that project as well because you want to receive glory or praise for the effort that you put forth or your accomplishment. That's from a physical standpoint to show you the physical things that we experience have a spiritual counterpart that's so very important to recognize. Yahweh in the 42nd chapter of Isaiah says he doesn't want the glory to go anywhere else. 
and the founder who had received the divine vision revelation is talked about the moderation he also he wasn't taking glory unto himself he's giving glory back unto yahweh and when people came to moses back here in the wilderness said moses you took too much upon yourself moses hit the ground he didn't want that glory either all glory is given back unto yahweh and we give all glory unto yahweh through yahshua the messiah and that's that is a whole uh, the discourse and lecture in itself as dr yules had talked about it can't cover all these things we encourage you to come back not because we want you to come back so we can collect any money because that doesn't occur here it's that we want you to pay attention okay so just recap 42 and 8 there for a second then we'll go to isaiah 2019 uh psalms uh, or, uh yeah psalms 19 and one yeah uh, isaiah 42 and 8. yep I, yahweh that is my name and my name glory will i not give to another neither yeah, this glory will not give to another and it's for that namesake you know when someone passes away they read psalms 23 right he'll lead you to the valley of the shadow of death and all those things but all those things are all done for what for his namesake right to give power and glory unto yahweh give it back unto him he who creates who he who caused to exist or Aya asher Aya, which you know i will be what i will to be he's willed it to be cause it to happen and he's ma making sure that that's going to take place he's not a failing l we'll go over to uh, psalms 19 and 10. psalm 19 and 1. thank you to the chief to the chief musician a psalm of david oh, the heavens uh, declare yeah okay the heavens declare the glory of Yahweh, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And the heavens declare, even the heavens that Yahweh created declare the glory unto him. And we just went to Psalms 150 and verse 6, that everything had breath, praise unto Yahweh. Right? Even if you don't recognize the name Yahweh, have never heard it before, you're still giving praise unto him and listen to your friend or, or listen to someone when they're sleeping or if you're, you know, whatever. Even listen to your animals, your pets. They're, they're all breathing and they're giving glory unto Yahweh, even if it's not known unto them. That's how wonderful and how tight that Yahweh has these things set up to accomplish his purpose and his will to set up glory that comes back unto himself. Okay? Just like that rain, right, in Isaiah 55, the word of Yahweh will go forth, right, and won't return to him void. There's the actual Messiah and the earth plane and a physical manifestation down here. Okay, I know it's hard to see because of the way the church is set up here. But there's Yahweh. Or there's Yahweh. Well, this that's Yahweh too, because Yahweh is a unity. Okay, it's important to pay attention to Yahweh. The word of Yahweh will go forth and will not return him void. He's there working his work on the earth plane. He's over there back in the in the book. He's over here, he's authoring. He wrote these things out here as covenant for the children of Israel. This wasn't given to the Jews, so you know uh, that's not i'm not jewish or hebrew it's not my background these weren't given to me or my lineage at all and so forth okay but these were given to the jews and the jews only back there in the wilderness of sinai but he's authoring he's giving a way for those people those children of israel that way of uh escape from their sin and look he also was like comes on the scene to fulfill and now he's merciful he's bringing in the gentiles everybody else seven years later after pentecost and when he's bringing them in when peter is sent to Cornelius's house he needed a witness. A vision was given to him three times. Okay, and you can look. You can get, like there's a lot of information right there as well. But that when he got to Cornelius's house, what is he sharing with them? He's talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah, which is not something that happens happens to answer just out there. It's happening because it was written about him in the scriptures beforehand. Carry on a little bit further in Psalms, and then I want to get to. John 5 and uh, 39. Psalm 19, verse 2. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. Yeah, night unto yeah. night day, day showeth knowledge, right? Okay, read on. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. That's right. There's a, you can't escape whatever language. At one time, people all spoke the same language, okay? But the Tower of Babel... Babel, Babel back here, the language we were confounded. And because they were trying to bring glory upon themselves, men of renown, that, that Yahweh caused them to have their languages changed. So all of a sudden, if you're in a work site, if everyone's speaking one language, everyone can communicate to form to say, oh, bring this bricks over here, bring the ladder over there. We got to build a scaffold over here and, and do this there, whatever. But if all of a sudden people can't understand the foreman and they can't understand each other, how are you going to get that project done? 
people can't communicate anymore, right? That's how those things all work together, okay? But you can't escape this glory. When you look at a proper name, my name is Lionel, L-I-O-N-E-L. And my name is the same if you want to speak uh, Ukrainian, Russian, Swahili. My name is Lionel. If you're going to introduce me as Lionel, the words before my name and the words after my name in a different language might be different than English, but my name is still going to reflect and show as Lionel. Okay, it doesn't change. Okay? These things are important to pay attention to. Read on. Uh, verse 4, their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Yeah, and them uh, hath he said. Yeah, when, so when the vision the vision and revelation that Moses had received of the burning bush here with the name of Yahweh given unto him, okay, the name that was given unto him, what that what did he do with that vision? Did he did he put it in his back pocket and carry on tending to the sheep? No. He protested and he didn't want to go down to Egypt and he complained and made excuses. But Yahweh, who made his mouth, which you can read about in Exodus the fourth chapter sent his brother Aaron to meet him. So when Aaron got together with Moses, Aaron, Moses was greeted with a kiss, as already Yahweh had all set up and made it manifest it was going to happen. And that Moses explained and shared everything that he received in his vision of revelation, which was given to him from Yahweh Elohim at the burning bush. And he had then explained those things to Aaron. And then Aaron and Moses went down to the children of Israel, being a beat unto Yahweh, rehearsed and shared the vision of that name revealed here and the wonders and works now, throwing a rod and throwing it down and becoming a serpent what's that purpose there that's to show that yahweh wills to be what he wills to be okay he willed the creation in he's done it he's gonna turn a rod into a serpent he's done it he's gonna prepare a fish for jonah he's gonna do it he's gonna provide a lamb ram in the thicket for for abraham when he's about to sacrifice isaac He's going to prepare an ark for people that mm -hmm. all these things all fall a pattern of blood, water, spirit, 40, death, burial, resurrection, the same principles over and over and over again. That's your comfort food because you know it's following the pattern. If it's outside the pattern, it's outside of the box, it's a problem. It's, it's someone freestyling or whatever you want to call it. But they repeat the vision down here. It's important. Okay. Now, the, now uh, Exodus 3 and 13, please. And then I went off of Exodus, uh, Acts 7, no, no, Acts 4 and 6. Exodus three thirteen, And Moses said unto Elohim, Behold, when I come unto all the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The Elohim of your fathers has sent me unto you, what shall they say to me? Yeah. What is his name? Yeah. And what shall well, I say unto them? That's right. Now, they would have known through the lineage and so forth that they talked about you know, the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so forth. But wait, these children of Israel are in bondage. What does that mean when you're in bondage or you're occupied force? My parents grew up in occupied Hollander in war. Regardless of what they believed or whatever they thought, they were still in the envelope of Nazi Germany at that time. So they couldn't get outside of that envelope or they'd be killed or sent to a camp or whatever else would happen, okay? You're, you're in bondage. You are subject to the rulers of the day when that's the case. The children of Israel down here, even if they recognize that Elohim, their fathers, and so forth, was out there, and there's a promise given about the promised land, they're still in bondage here. And again, this, this whole migratory pattern speaks about Yahweh's purpose and plan, which is demonstrating salvation, which is right in the name, Yahatua. Yahweh is salvation. Okay? All right? So what's he going to say unto them? He wants to, uh, did you finish? Is that all 13? Uh, 13 is done yet. Yep. Yeah, thank you. So he wants us what name? Why? Because it, it's, a, it's a, a many gods down here. Each god's got a name, right? Pharaoh in the fourth chapter, uh, fifth chapter of Exodus. Jump over there for a second. Is it five and one? I think it is. Uh, five and one. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh. Right, let's, let's say let's, how let's do me a favor. Sorry, let's go up. Uh, uh five and uh exodus four and 29 we'll read down sorry i'm not all right. much longer here so i'm trying to watch my time as well all right exodus 4 29 and moses and aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of israel we just talked about that moses is complaining now he gives them witnesses we daryl got that earlier about the two or three witnesses not one on its own 
a multitude of witnesses. This world of these days gets away from witnesses and my truth and your truth. There's one absolute truth of witnesses that confirm each other, and that's yeah, all according to Yahweh's purpose and plan. Okay. And they get together with Aaron and go on down there, and they get to gather together the gather together the the leaders of the day or the leaders of the children of Israel down here. Even though they're in bondage, they still have people appointed to be in charge of those different components. Okay, we done. Verse 30, and Aaron spake all the words which Yahweh hath spoken unto Moses. Now, and did he, the he, well, Aaron didn't wasn't at the burning bush, but he's repeating the words that were given to burning bush. Why is that? Moses didn't speak well. He stuttered. That was part of his excuse. But Yahweh provided Aaron. So Aaron is explaining all the things that Moses had saw and talking about the wonders. And Moses is right there. So if Aaron says something that didn't happen, Moses could cut him off and say, hey, even if he's stuttering, you missed something. Where you got it wrong, right? <laughs> in the history of these schools, these things have happened at various times as well, where people got up and they said something to speak of themselves, and it wasn't in the book, and people were corrected and cut off and instructed in, in, a, in a peaceful, harmonious manner because they were here to edify each other and lift each other up, okay? He was right there to confirm what Aaron was, was saying. We done? And Aaron spake all the words which Yahweh had spoken unto Moses. Not and some did of the, the words all of the words and that's important right all not some when you get some you can, you can select you can choose what works best for you right you you can that i like that part so i'll share that wait all the words sometimes that has a hard truth with it that needs to be expressed as well read on and did the signs in the sight of the people and they did the signs again right read on and the people believed and when they heard that Yahweh had visited the children of Israel. Those signs back here with Moses, that's a witness. And that witness that was shown to Moses here, they just said they did the signs again. That witness traveled with them. It wasn't a one-off. Why? When Moses is down there with Janus and Jambres as well, those witnesses endure forevermore. Okay, uh, carry on. And the people believed. And, the and people when they believed. heard that Yahweh had visited the children of Israel, and that he looked upon their affliction, then they borrowed, bowed their heads and worshiped. Yeah, they believed, right? They didn't know the name of Yahweh before. And you get that in Exodus, uh, Exodus 6 and 4, I think it is, if you get that real quick. Sorry, I'm jumping around here. They didn't know him as Yahweh before, but now it's being shown with signs and wonders, the witnesses. Now they believe, they bowed their head and worshiped, okay? They were given those witnesses. And the same thing in these schools, it's encouraged to check these things out for yourself. Don't believe it because I'm telling you. Don't believe it because Daryl was, 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 went to seminary school. Don't believe it because so-and-so did this and that. Don't believe it because someone's been in this school for 50 years. Don't believe it because someone has a PhD. No, you check it out for yourself because you're individually accountable. We are all individually accountable. Okay? Um, so what else I got? Exodus 6 and 4. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, uh, six and four. Go to read a uh, verse uh, five and two first. All right, five and two. And Pharaoh said, "Who is Yahweh that I should obey His voice?" Who is Yahweh? Pharaoh said, "Who's Yahweh?" He didn't know Yahweh. It wasn't given on him anyway. He had a, he was a house. He had an ear full and a brain full and a heart full of gods of their own society and own culture. Who is this Yahweh? Later on, you're going to find he's later on. He's saying, hey, listen, when you guys get out of here, pray for me. Right. And the, and the chariots are over there in Exodus, the 14th chapter stuck in the mud. And they know that Yahweh's fighting for Israel back over here. And they, they know they're about, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. OK, go Exodus uh, six and four. Thanks. Six and four. And I have also established my covenant with them yeah. to give them the land of Canaan. And the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. Yeah. Uh, by the name I, of Yahweh, I was not known unto them. Sorry, maybe I got the wrong verse. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, six and three. Sorry. Six and three. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto well, Jacob. Who appeared? Right? It's important in your book to you know where who's starting. And that's not, that's not Sarah's fault. That's my fault. Okay. Uh, go up to the second uh, verse one quickly. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with yeah, a strong Yahweh. hand. Said to Moses, see what I'm going to do to Pharaoh. He's going to he's going to level him. He raised up Pharaoh for his purpose, for his namesake. 
Why? Because he, well, you think of this age. Who's got the most oil in this world? Controls a lot of the population. Who's got the most food in the world? Controls those people that do not. Whoever's got the most money controls those that don't have money, right? So when Egypt had built up the storehouses and there's a famine in the land, they had all the food and the people came all there and they had the power and control. And Yahweh caused him them to be raised up to level them. Okay, for what? The power of his namesake. Read on. Um, and Yahweh said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I do to what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and yeah. with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. Yeah, and Elohim him hand, spoke he's to come after him with chariots, right? Get out of here, and the way Yahweh hardened his heart over and over again, by, and then they're chasing him to the Red Sea and so forth. Okay, but read on. And Elohim spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am Yahweh, and I yeah. appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob as El Shaddai. So all down this name. line here, when this this tabernacle, this chart here, the elementary chart, this children exodus is over here. This is a timeline, as it were, or a map to understand something. So all the way from the garden through Noah, through Abraham, Jer you know, and all those patriarchs beforehand, before you got to Moses, you know, and and, and you know, and Abraham, is, they didn't know him as Yahweh. They knew him as El Shaddai, which means Almighty Provider. He's still the Almighty Provider, but once you know his name, that's the key is the recognizing and maintaining and giving reverence and glory unto that name. He's still providing, yep. He, you know, he knows your heart and mind, yep, absolutely. But once you got that name, you can't go back, okay? Because Yahweh said so. We just covered that in Isaiah, the 42nd chapter, verse 8. They knew him as El Shaddai, but now once you know that name, that's the way it is. When you get when you go to work and you know you're you meet your boss for the first time, oh, this is your boss, this is your boss. Well, eventually at some point in time you get another name. And it's Mr. Steve or Mr. Ash or Mr. Whatever it is, or Mrs. So and so. You know what I'm saying? Or you meet your partner in this world and it's it's so and so. It's this once you know your partner's name, you can't go back and you can't start substituting someone else's name for your partner's name, or you're gonna be whipped out of the house pretty quick. Okay. Uh, these things are important as much as we, you know, I'm not trying to make light of these things. John 5 and 39. Well, Acts, sorry, Acts, uh, Acts 4 and 6. So, later, you know, you say, oh, that's the Old Testament. I'm, I, my family were New Testament Christians or whatever else, okay? Back there, Moses had asked in Exodus 3 and 13, he said, listen, what name, right? So, 4 and, uh, 4 and 6, Acts. Acts 4, verse 6. And Anas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as, it met, as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Because Peter and John healed a guy that was outside the temple for 40 years. And number 40 is important. Follow it ties in the pattern as well. But that's a different lecture again. Okay. There's so much we can all learn. Still learn. I'm a student too. Okay. Read on. Verse 7, and when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? See, that's similar. Back over here, what Moses is going down here. Now these uh, high priests and so forth, they're asking Peter and John, by what name or what power have you done this? Why are you healing, right? Because if there's name, in a the name there's power, okay? And there's there's that energy and there's that truth and that Divine power that operates in the name is in the name of Yahweh. Okay, by what name have you done these things? They're asking him, right? They want to know because they're not preaching in the name of Yahweh. Otherwise, they wouldn't have come up upon them in the beginning, as you read about in the second verse of the fourth chapter, because they were preaching Adonai. They weren't preaching Yahweh. They certainly weren't preaching Yahshua, and they weren't preaching Jesus. Why weren't they preaching Jesus back there in the Bible? Why not? Because there's no letter J in the English language at that time. Go look it up for yourself. Oh, well, the Bible's not in English. No, no J in Latin. No G, no J in Greek, and no G, G in Hebrew either. You can't call someone those things at that time. When you look at the meaning of it, he is Zeus or Helian Zeus and so on, that's different than Yahshua. Yahshua, Yahweh's coming in his father, or Yahshua's coming in his father's name. You get the Yah, and the, and the Yah over there in the first part of Yahshua. Right? Yahweh is one El, Yahweh is one spirit. It comes to two manifestations. Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim, and then Yahshua. 
Okay, read on. Verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, yep. by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Yahshua the Messiah, whom ye crucified, whom Yahweh raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. If they're on the same page preaching Yahshua, they'd be high-fiving and hugging each other. But they weren't when you read that chapter. They weren't. He's there preaching Yahshua. Those, the, Peter and John were preaching Yahshua. Those priests and scribes, scribes there, they were not preaching Yahshua. Preaching Yahshua was going to deny their power. Preaching Yahshua was going to set it up where they what? They were they, they crucify their Savior. How could it be that they crucify their Savior? They're not recognizing or it's not revealed to them the purpose of Yahweh. That Yahshua wasn't there to be king on earth for hundreds of years. He was there to take out and fulfill that old covenant and uh, get you the point of out, get to the point of out, point of the Holy Spirit, which the Holy Spirit has a name. And the Holy Spirit, the name of the Holy Spirit in or out of physical body is Yahshua. Okay? John 5 and 39. I think, and then I'm going to yield the floor here. There's, there's so much more stuff, and, you, you know, and um, there's so much stuff here. Uh, John, John, yeah, John 5 and 39, this is Joshua speaking. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. Well, and I they the are Bible. Jimmy, Jimmy Bob and Sally Sue or whoever it is, you know, in prison, they got a Bible there or whatever else to search the Bible. The priest's got a Bible. The Bible is one of the most popular books all over the place. He searches the scriptures. For what? Looking for eternal life. Everyone wants to have that eternal life. Everyone wants to go to heaven. Everyone wants to be, right? He search those things. But those he's talking to the scribes and the Pharisees that are not going to recognize and give glory unto Yahweh. They want to keep glory unto themselves. And, by, and how does the ruler keep power? They keep people repressed. History speaks to that over and over and over again. History repeats. Okay? No leader will give up their power. <laughs> oh, I guess I'm done. You know, no, not really. They they hang on tooth and nail. Okay, read on. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Those scriptures, which is the law, the first five books, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, etc., Numbers, Genesis, they all speak of Yahshua the Messiah. And the scr and the and the, uh, the Psalms and then all through the prophets, they're all speaking of Yahshua the Messiah. But they're not going to come to the Messiah, even though they search the scriptures, because they're not going to recognize him. He's coming in the volume of the book that's written of him. Okay? Go down to 46 for a second. Verse 46. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. If for you he wrote would have Moses, you would have believed Yahshua. But you didn't believe Moses truly. You used Moses and what he wrote for your own agenda, your own power trip. People do that. They got a Bible. They pick and choose the verses, and they use it for their narrative their desire to do whatever in their own way but the bible and those scriptures were not written for any private interpretation at all okay jump back up to uh uh 39 uh, 43 i am come in my father's name joshua and you receive he, he, joshua still, he says he comes in his father's name my name is van Manjou. it's complicated for people to say my the father's last name is van Manjou. Sam Lattimore, he's coming in his father's name. His father's name is Nick Lattimore, okay? And Nick's dad is 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 so and so Lattimore. Sorry, Nick, I know your dad is saying right. Is that typical? How it goes. Now, some people these days have different kinds of last names and do some kind of funky stuff. But our basic principle, that's how it works. And Yahweh's actually saying he's coming in his father's name. Carry on, Sarah. I'll recap. I am come in my father's name, and you receive me not. You come in the father's it name, and you're not receiving him. Those people were not receiving him. And the general population, they were going to be suppressed and subdued by those rulers and leaders of the day. Because those people were going to serve just power. When John was a, when the Oshawa came to came to John to be immersed to fulfill baptism, the Oshawa didn't come to start baptism, he's come to fulfill it. Where who's on the banks? The scribes and the Pharisees, right? They're keeping an eye what's going on because if the, the, the power grows, that rebellion grows, they're going to have a problem with it. Okay. Will you uh, recap that last part? I am come in my father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him he will receive. Yahshua is coming in his father's name. Yahweh is salvation, which is what Yahshua means. 
the children of Israel speaking to Yahshua, the flood speaking to Yahshua, saved in childbearing back in the garden, speaking to Yahshua, the speaking to Yahshua there with, a, with Abraham and our Isaac being saved, that the tabernacle pattern speaking to Yahshua the Messiah is that intercessor, that true intercessor, and so on and so on and so on. But you will not let another come in their own name, him you'll receive. Anyway, I thank you for this opportunity. There's so much more to share, and it's uh, always a pleasure to get together and come to class and so forth. And if you got questions, write them down. We can address those at the end as well, by all means. Uh, if possible, I'd like to call our, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Felicia Hamilton from Southfield, Michigan, if you're able. Good afternoon, class. And Definitely. let me, um, I see Lionel lets you share your screen, so let me yeah, do cool. that now. Yeah. Um, I am very, very happy to be here. Um, I do enjoy coming to the Hamilton class, um, not just because it has my name, but <laughs> because this is where the truth is being preached. Um, I enjoyed the two previous speakers. And first, I want to say to our younger brethren that are traveling, may Yashua grant you safe passage there and back. Um, we know traveling on the road is one of the most dangerous forms of transportation, but we also know that um, Yahweh is with you, as one of the Lattimore boys already knows, um, mm -hmm. that he will protect you and guide you. So may you have safe passage. Um, so what we want, what was uh, explained to you was something that each and every person on this call has had the pleasure to experience. And we know this is a school. It's not a church. It is a school. It's not a church. And although you may see um, someone with pictures displaying a person on a cross, we quote the Bible, it is not a church. Church means assembly or congregation. Here, what we do is we come to learn about the truth about our Heavenly Father, which is our first aim, if you heard it, is to find and is to help you to find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. And when I think about um, the Lattimore children and the ages that they are, I remember, I reflect on the age I was when I was their age. And I think about the mindset I had and the mindsets some of their friends may have as they're listening to this. And I think, you know, when I was uh, a senior in high school, um, I couldn't wait to not come to class anymore. It was just, you know, it's not that I didn't believe it. I just thought, you know, oh, it's all hokey and, you know, oh my gosh, this is not, you know, it's not that important. I want to be part of the real world. I want to be, you know, out there doing the things my friends are doing and having fun and living my life. And that's what I thought at that age. I mean, a lot of people think that at that, at, at that age, some people don't, some people have born and raised in the school don't, but um, I think I was nine when we came in. So pretty much raised in the school, but I didn't want anything to do with it after high school. I went to class every time because my mother made me go to class. And for us, it was a two hour trip on Sundays, two hours to Saginaw, two hours back. So that was four hours of my day on a Sunday when I wanted to just rest and relax. So when I uh, graduated high school and went to college, I was just like, oh my goodness, I'm so glad not to be here. <laughs> But then the funny thing is, the college that I went to, um, one of the brethren that's part of the school that's been been here since since she was born into it also went to that school. So we ended up running into each other, and lo and behold, I find myself back in class. And so it's just what it does it it reminds me that your life has a purpose from the time you are born. Actually, it it has a purpose from the very beginning of foundation, but that's another story. But um, I know the mindset of younger people is that, you know, I know you may think the Lattimore boys are just so, you know, too religious or too hokey or whatever, but what they have come to understand and what Yahweh has allowed them to come to understand at such a young age is how important this really is. It's not a, um, it's not a thing for them or a thing that their family does. What they have come to realize is that this is the most important thing that you will ever have the opportunity to learn about. And the reason that is, 
is because every single thing you will encounter in your life goes by a pattern. And every single thing that you will encounter in your life has its origin in spirit. And when you know that, when you really truly understand that, then you start to make sense of things in the world that don't make sense to anybody else. So um, Dr. Von Manju talked about the importance of a name. And, and um, Dr. Hughes talked about being a minister or a pastor. He was in the Christian church. He, he wore the collar. He went to seminary school. And one of the first things they learn is the true name of your heavenly father. But then they say, well, it doesn't matter what you call him. But wait a second. I can't walk up to Lionel and call him Kathy. And he answered me. I can't walk up to Janine and call her Felicia. And she answers. A name does matter. And if you think about history, and I know you all have had history classes, when you take a history class, can you think of one figure in history that as time went on, the name of that historical figure changed? I, and I hated history as a kid, even though I was a straight A student, I hated history because to me it was boring. It didn't mean anything. What was the point? But when I think back to my high school history lessons, I go, well, you know, when I think about it, there was not one historical figure in history that we changed their name and everybody was OK with that. Not one. So why is it that the most important name in the history of mankind, we say, ah, it doesn't matter what you call him. He knows who you're talking to. Oh. It, it just doesn't sit right. I mean, just sit and think about that. And that's why we say this is a school and not a church. We, didn't, we don't come here to preach to you morals about what's right and wrong. You know that without even, without even having to teach you that. You know as a little kid if you're lying or not, and it's not right to lie. You know as a little kid it's not right to steal or to hurt people. You know that. So we don't have to teach you something you already know. What we're here to do and what you go to school for is to learn about things you don't already know about. If you knew about every subject in school, in high school, you wouldn't need to go. So the reason we come here um, time after time and year after year is because we continually come to learn things we know nothing about. Now, for me, I love reading about uh, the books in the so-called Old Testament. Those are the Law and the Prophets. The first five books are the Law. The next 34 books are the prophets. I love reading the book of Kings. Um, if you love, I will say to one of the young people, if you love action movies, read the book of Kings. That, that will get you right there. If you love suspense and murder and all that, read the Old Testament. What these books tell you is that there is a history that the creator of heaven and earth talked about before the so-called New Testament was written. And we, there's a scripture where the, the uh, Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus, there is a scripture where he's talking to his disciples and he says, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them the things concerning himself. Now, when the Messiah was walking the earth plane, the old, the, excuse me, the New Testament wasn't written. It wasn't written until after he died. So he couldn't have been talking about the so-called New Testament. He was talking about the Old Testament. So that's why every time you come to this class, we start at Moses. What do you mean you start at Moses? Well, we start with Moses at, and, and my screen loads a little low, but we start at Moses um, being, um, be fleeing the land of Egypt um, and then going into the wilderness of Sinai and receiving Yahweh's true name. The reason we do that is because the Messiah himself told us that's where you start. Um, so we go back to the Old Testament, which is, you know, Exodus, Genesis, and Deuteronomy. Um, and I said Exodus first and not Genesis. You got to come back to this class and learn why that is, why Genesis is not the first book of the Bible. It's actually Exodus. But again, just speaking to the young people, the reason we, the reason the Lattimore children, Yahweh has allowed them to be so passionate about this gospel is because they understand the significance 
of what Moses was shown in that mount. And they understand the significance of a name because a name does matter. If you want to walk into, let's say, British Parliament and present yourself and present something that you think is important, they're going to ask you what your name is. So a name is important. And I won't go too much further into that because that's something that you can easily Google. The name is Yahshua, the savior of the world's name was Yahshua, is not Jesus. Why? Because there was no J in the English, Hebrew, Greek, or Latin language when he walked the face of the earth as Yahshua the Messiah. And to this day, there is no J or J sound in the Hebrew, Greek, or Latin languages to this very day. If you know anyone that pledges a sorority or a fraternity, you ask them to recite the Greek alphabet, there is no J. They can go all through it and there is no J. So that's one of the things that's known in this world. So it's it's not something I'm going to continue on with because you're you can look that up yourself. So what we have begun to understand is that there is a, a divine pattern of the universe that is governing every single thing in the universe. Now, think about when I say universe, it's not our solar system. The universe incorporates everything, right? So when you think of the universe, you think of our solar system. Um, I think it was, we were trying to see it the other night, one of the uh, other, the sister solar system of ours, and I can't think, it may have been the Galilean solar system, I can't remember, but all these solar systems are, are, are encompassed in the universe. So that means that the universe is all encompassing. Everything that you can even think of is within the universe. Why is that? Because it's pointing to something spiritual. So when you think about the universe, you think of your creator. So everything, and and if you listen to the moderation, it's important to listen to that moderation. You see this cloud on this chart? This cloud is drawn all around the edges to show you that everything on the chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe is within Yahweh. So Yahweh, because he is eternal, because he is all in all, you can't get outside of him to look back at him to say, oh, that's what Yahweh looks like. It's impossible because he encompasses everything. So you can't get outside of him, underneath him, above him, or beside him to see what he looks like. He incorporates everything. So because of that, and because he is the archetype, which means original pattern, which is the um, uh, the um, derivative of pater, which is father, which means father, he is the father or the original of everything in the creation. So think about that. You have, uh, Dr. Vaimanju said it, you have uh, a child that is born to parents, right? And that child, a lot of times when you look at that child, they're born, the first thing you look at, oh my gosh, he has his mom's nose, he has his dad's eyes. Why do you say that? You say that because you know it took the DNA of the mom and the DNA of the dad to make that child. So there has to be some expectation that that child is gonna look like one or both parents. That's expected, that's just like, duh, if it doesn't, you know, and this happens, um, this actually happens in real life and it's not to, it's not to play off on it, but if you have uh, two white people and their baby comes out black, you're looking at the mom like, excuse me, you know, even though sometimes that's happened because you have uh, genes that come down through creation, but typically you, you wouldn't see that you, you'd be like, okay, somebody, uh, somebody has an explanation. Somebody needs to explain something. So you expect that child to have some characteristics of its, its origin or its parent. That's what the creation is. Because the creation comes out of pure spirit, which is Yahweh, you have to expect some similarity to the original archetype. So what Yahweh did, because he knew that he created us limited, he took on shape and form right within himself. Because remember, Yahweh and pure spirit encompasses everything. So Yahweh is not 
Yahweh can't create a shape and form that goes outside of him. He created a shape and form that was right within him. And that shape and form was Elohim, the archetype pattern of the universe. And so because that form can only be seen in divine visions and revelations, he had to further break it down to a form that was more physical. And that's what he showed Moses in the mount. So what he showed Moses was that that um, super incorporeal form. Then he showed Moses, OK, Moses, I'm going to show you something physical that's going to represent that super incorporeal shape and form. And what he showed him was the tabernacle pattern that the children of Israel built in the wilderness. And that's this here. So this is the tabernacle pattern. It's three. It has three um, kind of like compartments, but they are one tabernacle. Well, why would it have three compartments in this one tabernacle? That's because Yahweh is Yahweh pure spirit. Yahweh in incorporeal shape and form that can only be seen in divine visions and revelations. And then he's Yahweh manifested in the physical body as Joshua the Messiah. These three are one. So these three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern to show you that your heavenly father can be exist in three states, but it's still just your father. So let's take that again. When the Lattimore kids talk to their dad, they go to their dad as children. I am your child. Even I don't know matter how old you get, you're still your parent's child. You may be an adult, but you're still their child. They don't treat you like children anymore, but you're still their child. So when you go to your parents, you go to them as their child, as their offspring. That's your dad, right? When your dad goes to work, he's at work as an employee. He doesn't go in there and start talking to the other employees like they're his children. If he did, he's going to have a problem. Then when your dad goes to his wife or his spouse, he goes to them as a wife, a partner, or a spouse. He doesn't talk to that wife or partner or spouse like they're an employee or a child. If he did, there's a problem. But guess what? That dad is still one person. He's just taking on different roles. So that's how you think of Yahweh, who is the creator of heaven and earth. He's taking on different roles. In the, in the role of, um, of the father, who is Yahweh, he, that, that's that pure spirit state that cannot be seen um, or understood in anything but pure spirit. That's what he is. So we have it here on this chart. Yahweh is spirit. It's the substance, the essence. So we say, what is pure spirit? And Dr. Hughes can testify this. If you ask a Christian or a pastor, well, what is spirit? Well, spirit is God. Okay. Well, what is God? Well, God is spirit. Okay, you still didn't give me an answer. What's, what is what? So here we can tell you what spirit is. Spirit is the ultimate. And you know, if you're in school, ultimate means you can't get past that. That's, that's the highest you can go or what we call in my field and IT is the North Star. It's the ultimate. Spirit is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. So anything that you can see, touch, taste, smell, perceive, gets its origin from spirit. Nothing is outside of that. That's what spirit is. So, oh, okay, that's what spirit is. So everything has its origin in spirit. Then what Yahweh does is he says, okay, sometimes I want to present myself to my children in a super incorporeal shape and form that can only be seen when I give them a vision. That form is Elohim, uh, the creator of heaven and earth. That's a whole nother lecture. Yahweh in this pure spirit form didn't create the heavens and the earth. Yahweh Elohim in this super incorporeal form created the heaven and earth. Again, another lecture. You got to come back for that. So this form here can be seen in div divine visions and revelations. So remember, you got a dad who's a husband, who's an employee, but it's one dad, right? So that's what we're talking about. One creator who exists in different states. Then this creator said, okay, because I set this thing up to where my creatures are going to put themselves in jeopardy and they need me to save them, I have to then present myself in a different form. What form is that? It is the form of Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus. Now, this form, you can see, you can smell, you can touch him. 
You can taste him. I don't know. Well, that is a scripture. But you can hear him. Now, this form looks like me and you. You can touch him. You can handle him. Oh, okay. But guess what? All three of these are the same. They're just taking on different roles. Like that dad took on different roles. He takes on different, um, he puts on a different hat when he's dealing with his children versus his wife versus his employees or his employer. But it's all still the same. That's why it's important for you to understand that nothing, nothing escapes Yahweh because Yahweh is everything. Matter is just spirit materialized. Now, one of the things I remember from science class was that matter can neither be destroyed or created. So um, I remember this one science class in high school where the science teacher had us do um, an experiment where we burned some things, right? You would burn paper or a piece of wood or whatever, and you would wait until it turned to ash. And what he said to us, he said, now it's still wood. It's just ash. He said, but the matter is still there. It just changed shape and form. He said, now, if I continue to burn it and continue to disintegrate it, it'll turn to something that you can't even see, which is, you know, to its very essence, it's, um, it's atoms. It'll be a proton, neutron, electron, which you can't see to your phys- with your physical eye. But guess what? It's still there. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And that blew my mind as a kid because I'm like, remember, I'm in class, but I didn't think it was important. But I was like, oh, we talk about that in class. It's like, yeah. So everything matter is just spirit materialized. And then matter is neither destroyed or created. So as a kid, you think, well, who created God? And you're like, nobody. He just always was. And that's that matter is neither destroyed or created. It just changes shape and form. It changes what it looks like. So you think about that. Okay. Now you begin to understand how that we know that our creator is real because everything in the universe has a beginning and it has an end except him. The creation has a beginning, you know, the earth, the moon, the stars, the universe had a, had a beginning. It has an end. But guess what? Yahweh is eternal. He does not have a beginning or an end. And we talk about that with our ages and dispensations chart. So when you look at it, you see beginning here, you see ending. But guess what you also see? You still see that cloud, right? All around the edges of the chart because it symbolizes eternity. Yahweh is eternal. So he can create, he can destroy that is who you fear. You don't fear anybody else. You respect people. You respect your parents. You respect authority, but you don't fear them. Hopefully you don't fear your parents. You fear them enough to have what's called respect or reverence for them, but you don't fear them in a way like, oh my gosh, I don't even want to go home because I'm scared of my parents. Hopefully that's not the case. If you have good parents, it's not the case. But Yahweh, because Yahweh is the only one that can create and destroy, that's who you fear. So what we want you to understand at the ages that you're at, because believe it or not, and I know sometimes it's hard to believe every single person on this call was your age at one point in time, because I still remember being that age and my mind thinks I am, but my body says, you might not want to do that. Um, But what we want you to understand is that what you have been allowed to come to is the answer to all your questions. And I can say that with confidence because it was proven to me. Now, for me, the proof was how the tabernacle pattern um, explained my human body. That blew my mind because I was just, I'm in love with science, all things science, whether it's the creation, whether it's the sun, moon, and stars, whether it's the human body, I just love science. So when they took my human body and broke it down and showed me how my human body, mine, not someone else's, but mine went by this pattern. I was blown away. I said, okay, this, there has to be something to this. And that's what we want you to understand. We don't want you to believe anything anybody says to you, not even a Lattimore voice. You prove it for yourself. And the reason you prove it for yourself is when something's proven to you, it cannot be taken from you. So let's say, you know, you're finishing high school, you're going off to college, you finish college, you get that degree. Even let's say someone takes the degree from you. They said, you know what, we're going to take this degree from you. 
the things that you learn cannot be taken from you. That's yours forever. So that's why you want to prove things for yourself because then it becomes real to you. It becomes um, it becomes something that can't be taken away from you because you know it for sure. Our first aim used to be um, to learn and know Yahweh as he really is and actually exists. Then as more people started to prove it for themselves, after they, they put to the test the things that were told to them, then it changed to, to help you find and know. I can say to help you find because I know it's real. It's been proven to me and it continues to be proven to me day after day in my life. Because Yahweh is eternal, I can't stop learning about him. It's just, there's too much to know to stop learning about him. So like I said, when I, you know, the human body and science in particular is what gave me the confidence that, okay, this is real. First of all, the name, if there was no J, when he walked the earth, how the heck can you call him Jesus? And like um, Dr. Hewell said, God and Lord are not names, they're titles. How did we read over that all our lives? How did we buy that? We, it was just like, really, when it comes to religion, we all get stupid. We can learn, we can be the most, the, the smartest kids in our class. But when it comes to religion, we get dumber than a doorknob. It's like, oh, okay, the Lord, oh God, those aren't titles. I'm sorry, those aren't names, they're titles. But, but for some reason, we seem to take that as it is. And you shouldn't because it's your soul that's at stake. So for me, it was, the, like I said, it was the human body and it was science as a whole. So I do this thing um, once a month on Thursdays in our class called Science Thursday, where we go through a booklet or we go through something about science and we show you how it goes by the pattern. So here, this chart, we the nickname for it is the green chart, but it's actually called the creator, who is Yahweh, imaged, which is Yahweh Elohim, by his creation, which is Yahshua. So the creator imaged by his creation. And what we do is we take just little bits of everything and show you how it goes by a pattern, how everything points to Yahshua, the Messiah and Yahweh. And what you can do with that information, you can get A's in school because if you know there's a pattern, then you know, okay, the 33 vertebrae in my back actually point to the 33 years of the Messiah's life. Oh, okay. And your vertebrae does what for you? It gives you your uprightness. Oh, okay. With Yahshua, I, I'm upright. Oh, okay. A baby in the womb takes nine months or 40 weeks to build. Oh, wait a minute. The tabernacle pattern in the wilderness took nine months or 40 weeks to build. Man, something seems crazy here. It's familiar. My rib cage, there are 24 ribs in my body, 12 on each side. What does that talk to? It talks about it. I'm sorry. What does that point to? It points to the 12 tribes of Israel around the tabernacle pattern and the 12 apostles. That's 24. Oh, man, this stuff. OK, it has to be a coincidence. No, it's not. What are you talking about? The atom is a proton, a neutron and an electron. What does the electron do? The electron goes around the proton and a neutron. What is, how does, what does that point to? Your tabernacle pattern has a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. What? The court round about? The court goes around and about the nuclear, I'm sorry, the proton and the neutron. This is your electron. So nothing you can come up with escapes this tabernacle pattern, and it's the structure and the function. The structure, as you know, if you're in anatomy and physiology class, the structure is the anatomy, the physiology is the function. So all these things point to your heavenly father. So as a young person, what it does for you, it gives you a little bit more clarity than the person sitting next to you. Now, I can't compare my teenage years with yours because they're different. How are they different? We didn't have the internet. We didn't have uh, Facebook and all of that stuff. We didn't have social media. We, did we have cell? No, we didn't even have cell phones. We didn't have cell phones till I got in my 20s. So I can't compare my life to yours. But what I can say that's the same is that Yahweh allowed me to remember the foundation that he gave me with this gospel and allowed me to take it to school 
in my life and everything else to know, oh, okay, everything does go bad pattern. And it's significant because what you have to realize, and I'm going to go back to this green chart because it's very important for you to realize as a young person, when you think about the seasons of the year, we have fall, we have winter, we have spring, and we have summer. Now, and you you got to come back, please come back, or please ask Nick and his parents a little bit more, um, or the Lattimore's a little bit more. Fall comes first. And it's a reason for that is because Yahweh, El- Yahweh taking on shape and form as Yahweh Elohim is considered a downgrade. I'm going to use a real basic term, but we have fall. And what does that do? You see the leaves start to c- turn colors because they're dying, right? Then you have winter. What does winter do? Now, not everyone has snow, but they may have a rainy season, which, which brings about um, some kind of burial or death. So you think about sometimes when you're down about something, when you're depressed about something, you feel like you're dead in a way, right? It's like, oh my gosh, I just feel so depressed. I get like that sometimes and that's okay. We're not saying that's bad because everybody goes through that. But what you learn in this school is there is always, and those are capital letter always, always a resurrection. So when you're in that death state of spring or it's like sleep, right, then all of a sudden you start to feel a tingle. You're in your depression, right? But then something happens, some light or some event, somebody makes you laugh or something. Then you start to feel a little bit like you're coming back to yourself, that that's spring, that brings spring, that brings about new life, new joy. You're like, okay, I'm I'm not feeling so bad anymore. I'm starting to feel good that you know you're starting to blossom you're starting to see and then summer is the fruition it's just everything is pretty and glorious and summer and the birds are singing and you see all the plants and the beautiful flowers what is that talking about that's talking about your life or the purpose of Yahshua the Messiah who came from pure spirit which is the best and ultimate state you can be in as pure spirit he came down to a super incorporate form. Remember I talked about that Yahweh Elohim that's that's coming down. And then he came down into a physical shape and form. Do you realize that the physical is the lowest state of existence? We seem to think so highly of these bodies and everything that we can do in them, but that's actually the lowest state of existence. So when you're in your depression, you're actually considered in the court roundabout. Why is that? Because there's death here. Animals are being buried, killed, and burned here. But then as spring comes, remember, there's a, there's always a resurrection. Spring comes, you come into what's the holy place. Then you have light here. You have some bread or sustenance, something to feed you. And then you have what is known as the intercessor or something that's providing a guidance for you to the Father. That's your spring. Then you come in your summer, oh my goodness, everything is glorious. You're looking, you're seeing the father in his glorious state and it's just, oh, it's good. But guess what? Eventually you're gonna come back down. You're gonna get depressed a little bit again and that's okay. As long as you remember, and we had a member that used to say this all the time, Dr. Betty Cahey, there is always a resurrection. So when you're in your down state, when things don't seem right, when you get when you don't pass an exam or you don't think you're going to pass a class or when somebody rejects your advances, you know, somebody you really like and they don't like you when you're in that depressed state, always, always, always remember there's a resurrection. And the reason that's important, because a resurrection signifies hope. Hope is Yahshua, the Messiah. So for you to say there is no way out of this. I, I'm going to always be in this death state. What you've done is say that your father never, your father in this physical shape and form did not resurrect a spiritual body. You're saying that he's still dead. We're still waiting for him to come. No, he came back. He poured his spirit out. And now we're learning of him. So the Holy Spirit in me is immersing you in the voice so that now you can be baptized. So now you, you can understand that there is always a resurrection. So depression, believe it or not, sadness is just something we have to deal with while we're in this physical. But what it's doing is making us yearn and groan for a day when that is no longer 
something that we have to deal with. And that will be in the spiritual plane. Because remember I said the physical body is the lowest state of existence, this physical. A higher plane is the spiritual. And that's what we're all obtaining to. So as you move through, you know, high school, college, and you move through your life, and if this creation goes on and Yahweh allows you to have friends and a family and a career, always remember that at the center of all that is your savior who allowed you to experience those things. And he's allowed you to experience those things because he wants you to know that he is the way the truth and the life, that there is no life without him. There is no truth without him. And speaking of truth now, you all know that we're living in a time now where truth doesn't matter, where people can get on a stage and say any damn thing they want and people believe it. That isn't the worst part. The worst part is that I'm in the audience, I'm listening to this person and I know what they're saying is a lie, but I believe it anyway. That's the worst part because what you have done is said that you believe, you would rather believe a lie than the truth. And there's a scripture and Kathy quoted if you can, there's a scripture that speaks to what Yahweh does to people that would rather believe a truth than, I'm sorry, would rather believe a lie than the truth, which is what we have going on here today. Do you have that, Kathy? Second Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10. That's okay, go ahead and recite it. Mm-hmm. Okay, let me get it for you real quick. Okay. Second Thess 2, 9. Even him who's coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceitfulness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, Yahweh shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Mm, now think about that. I mean, <laughs> when I think about that, because you would rather, remember that game as a kid, would you rather? Because you would rather believe a lie because of the person that's saying it to you because you don't like the other person. So because you don't like the other person, you're going to believe this person that's telling you a lie, even though you know it's a lie. So because you choose that, what Yahweh will do is send you a strong delusion to seal you in that lie. He's going to seal you in that lie so that you not only believe it, you worship that lie. Why? So that you can be damned because in your heart, you rather believe a lie than the truth. That's scary to me. That always scared me as a kid. And that's why I'm like, eh, no, I don't believe you. Sorry, that's not how we should be. So again, I hope Yahshua grants you safe passage there and back. Enjoy yourselves. It's, it's okay to, to be a young person. It's okay to live your life. That is perfectly okay because that's what Yahweh gave you. He gave you this life to live, but always be mindful of the fact that you will take this flesh off. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And so we're not telling you to be like, you know, the, the starch Jews or Christians that you see is like, oh, you just shouldn't wear lipstick. You should, no, 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 no. Nobody said that. Yahweh never said that. What the only thing he's asking of you is to be a lover of the truth. And when you're a lover of the truth, what he will do for you will far exceed your expectations. So with that, I, I give all your honor and praise to Yahweh and ask him with a sincere heart to keep you and to help you understand and know him, how he really is and actually exists. And with that, I'll say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you very much, everyone, for your participation and joining class today. Um, Again, I'll send out the recording later on if you wanted to check out or miss something. Uh, again, safe travels for all those and safe travels for everyone's week. There's the North Texas Zoom class as well this afternoon at uh, 2 Central, 3 Eastern time. The link is in the uh, chat box. If you get to it and uh, if there's any questions, we'll take them after the doxology as well. So I'll be reading from, uh, if you can all raise your heart and mind, is able. Um, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yash the Messiah, our Sovereign, 
belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.